أعوذ بالله من الشيطان بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل الله فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره ولا دين كله ولو كره مشركون اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد وقال تعالى في كتاب الكريم بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإذا قرئ القرآن فاستمعوا له وأنسدوا لعلكم ترحمون صدق الله العظيم برد أسسني إسلام Alhamdulillah, all praises to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has brought us here in this house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to pray the Salat al-Maghrib, which is great rewards in itself, followed by listening to the Holy Quran in such a beautiful voice, mashallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the brother, may he increase him in his knowledge, in his qira'at, and his family, and, his, and all his you know, brothers and sisters who have helped him to become such a mashallah qadi of the Quran, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him and his family in this dunya and also the hereafter. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that when the Qur'an is recited, ponder upon it. I mean the Qur'an when it's recited, the main purpose is for it that we understand it and we do tatabur. And the Qur'an should pierce the hearts like how the knife pieces the meat. This is how the Qur'an, this is what the Qur'an does to the hearts. When it is recited in a beautiful voice, with the correct tajweed, with the correct recitation. So this is something which we should really uh, ponder upon. And you know, make something you know of our habit that we should listen to the Quran all the time. You know, when we're in the car, when we're at the house, rather than listen to anything else, we should listen to the Quran, which is the Quran of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Having said that, today's topic is not the, uh, the the recitation of the Quran, but it's something which we are carrying on from last week, which is the the lives of the companions, radiyallahu taala anhu ajma'in. And today we are talking about and we are explaining the life of the grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But before I start, I would like to recite a poetry which I found in the book Bidal Inha, narrated by uh, uh, Ibn Kathir. And he says that, ماذا تقولون إن قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لكم ماذا فعلتم وأنتم آخر الأمم بعترتي وبأهلي بعد مفتقدي منهم أسارة ومنهم درجوا بدم this is some uh, poetry relating to Imam Hussain radiallahu so What will you say on the day of judgment to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And what did you do uh, to him, i.e. to Hussain radiallahu ta'ala and you were the last of the ummah with my nasal bi itrati, my, 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 my generation and my family after I had left you, after I had passed away sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this share was recited after the martyrdom of Imam Hussain ibn, ibn Ali Abi, Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu ajma'in. Now the topic is very, very sensitive. And when I say sensitive, it's very emotional. But the purpose of today's reminder is not to make you guys emotional. But you see, the main purpose is for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to, to address the facts. To address the facts for our future generation, our youngsters who are with us, in order that there's no confusion in our minds with regards to the, uh, to the, uh, the beliefs of uh, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah regarding the grandson of Imam al Hussein. This is very, very important that we discuss this topic in order to clear the confusion that may be settled in our minds you know, through various reports through various, you know, we watch things on, on YouTube, etc. And, you know, the, the, you can mix the truth and the falsehood with the truth. And this happens to all of us. So I have chosen the book al Bidaya wa Nihaya. It's one of the great books of uh, tarikh, of history. It's in about 18 volumes. Uh, and it, it starts from the beginning uh, up till the time of Imam Ibn Kathir, uh, Rahimahullah. And he covers everything and he quotes different historians uh, he, 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 he narrates from different scholars of his time and it's one of the most sort of accurate up-to-date book you should find in regarding history and unfortunately it's only in Arabic you will not find a, a, a good translation in English uh, for the whole 18, 17, 18 volumes 
I have talked some abstracts from the uh, from the uh, from the narration. I think it covers the years between 60 after Hijri up to 62, 63. Now, if you ask me how many pages that is, I will tell you roughly how many pages this cover covers. It covers roughly about 200 pages of just the two years between 60 to 61, which is what we are going to be relating to the time frame of what happened. <coughs> So before I start, I would like to just mention a few things. Um, I know last week we had the reminder regarding the fourth caliph of Islam, uh, Hadrat Imam Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and he was the fourth caliph and he died in the month of Ramadan. And his, and his khilafat lasted for about three to five years. There's different narrations. Some say three years, some say up to five years. And he was also martyred. Now this get, brings me back to this notion of shahada, shahada fi sabirullah. We hear this a lot. We hear this a lot and our, our religion, our deed is full of martyrs. From the first woman who was martyred in Makkah al Mukarrama, as we all heard on Friday, the mother of Ammar ibn Yasir. She was the first lady, uh, woman to be uh, martyred in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also her husband, we all heard the, the story of the husband, what happened to the husband. But really the, 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 our, our history is full of martyrs and this will continue until the day of judgment. It's something we shouldn't be fearful about, we shouldn't be scared about this. This is part of our religion, our deen of Islam. And we had, before that, we had the, the Caliph Umar radiallahu ta'ala who was martyred in Salat al-Fajr with his, with his wife in the back rows, you know, witnessing the martyrdom. He was stabbed uh, by this person. And then we have the, the, the narration of Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu ta'ala who was also martyred. As we all know, he was surrounded in his compound, but he didn't fight back, even though he had the power, he had the strength to fight against them, but he didn't. We have the narration of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu ta'ala anhu, who was also martyred, Imam Hassan radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Then we come down to the life of Imam al Hussein uh, Abu Abdullah. So he was also called Abu Abdullah, this was his kunya. His birth and his name, why he was called uh, al Hussein, is very interesting because the first name he was given was al Harb, which means basically war and fighting. And this is something which his parents gave him, gave him the name. But the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam changed his name to Al Hussein, Hussein ibn Abi Talib. So this was something that he was given, and he was born roughly between five to six years after the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam his his risala. So this was something uh, the third year after Hijri. He was born roughly between this time to the fifth uh, year after Hijra. And we all know the narration that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam did his aqiqah on the seventh day. And he gave him obviously the, uh, the luqna in his mouth when he was born. And this was something which was the practice of the Prophet when, when a child was born, he would do his aqiqah after uh, seven days. And if it was a boy, he would shave his head, his head. And if it was a girl, he would remain or uh, we'll cut a bit of it off. With regards to his, his death, he, was, he died on a Friday, <coughs> uh, on the day, the 10th of Muharram, 61 AH. And he was aged 58 years old uh, when he uh, passed away. And it is narrated that he, he was most resemblance to the Prophet وسلم, from his stomach downwards. And Imam al-Hassan was most resemblance to the Prophet وسلم, from the stomach up to his, his head, his best head. This is in the narration in uh, Al-Bidai wa Nihayah. The Prophet وسلم, mentions even before the, uh, the martyrdom that, 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 that he will be martyred in the, in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was told that this grandson of yours, this son of yours, will be martyred. Uh, and the, even the land was told that this is the certain land. It is by the river Euphrates, And this is actually the, the type of sun which is actually in that area, the type of earth which is in that area. And this is narr narrated by a hadith by Jibra'il alayhi salam that he once entered upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he said that this son of yours, Ali Hussein, will be killed, will be martyred. And he said, if you want, I can show you the place where he will be martyred in, therein. So he brought out some, some, some sand, some earth, which was red in color. And this resembled the, the type of sand which you see in the place called Karb Obala. This is next to the river Euphrates. And when Ali ta'ala was going to Kufa, he stopped by this place. By chance, he stopped by this place. And it's narrated that he picked up the sand and he looked at it and he said, this is exactly the sand where my son is going to be martyred later on. And this is exactly what happened later on after about 30 years after he actually proclaimed this, in the year 61 uh, after Hijri. 
But before we go on to the, the actual, uh, the plain of uh, Karababala, which is a barren land outside uh, Kufa, we need to describe the, some background information of what happened before this, <coughs> what, ha what led to such a great atrocity in the history of Islam. There hasn't been a black, you know, a more severe day than the time when the grandson of the Prophet was, was, was martyred. There's not, never been a worse time for the Ummah. But really, there are many lessons which we can take from this. And this is really my whole purpose that, you know, I'm, I'm not here to narrate you a story, you know, to make you feel, you know, sudden. Yeah, verily, we'll be sudden. But there are really lessons which we must learn from the Shahada, from the martyrdom of Al Imam Al Hussein. But before we go to this, inshallah, I'll just mention a few things, a bit of background information, in order that it becomes clear what the situation was at the time when Imam Al Hussein left Medina firstly, and then he went to Mecca. And followed that, he left Mecca and he went on his way to Kufa. Now you must remember that when Imam Al Hassan, radiallahu anhu, he, he, he passed away, the Caliphate had stopped. The Caliphate ceased. There was no more Khilafat al-Rashid as we know it. The Khilafat al-Rashid was the way, the Caliphate on the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and those that followed him, i.e. the four Caliphs, plus Imam al-Hassan. This is agreed upon by Ijma' by the, uh, the, the scholars of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. After the, uh, the demise and the passing away of Imam al-Hassan, the uh, Mulukiya stat, so this was kingship, which was the first time uh, that the, 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 the leadership went to a family and it carried on in that family for over 80 to 100 years, some narrations say. But what happened was Imam uh, al-Hassan, he had a pact, he had, he had uh, agreed a, a treaty between him and Muawiyah when the, the, the dispute came between Imam Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And, the, and the, the treaty was that after his passing away, he wouldn't, you know, he wouldn't, uh, you know, give the, the, the leadership to his son, Yazid ibn Muawiyah. <coughs> Muawiyah, don't forget, was a Sahabi. As we all know, he became a Muslim at the time of the uh, Fath, uh, Fath Makkah, with his father Abu Sufyan. So his father was Abu Sufyan. <coughs> and he was from the Bani Umayyah, which was the same tribe, same clan, which Uthman ibn Affan belonged to. So the, the main demand from uh, Muawiyah to Ali radiallahu was to for the blood of the, those who killed Uthman ibn Affan, and this wasn't and this wasn't met. This wasn't met by the uh, neither by Imam Ali or his son Imam al-Hassan. But a, a pact was made between the two that once your time is up, you don't pass on the, the the leadership to your son. And this is what happened when he was about to die. <coughs> Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala from his own wisdom, from his own thinking. <coughs> He put down his son as the next leader, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Yazid ibn Muawiyah. This took place and straight away Yazid ibn Muawiyah, he claimed and he put out an order that everyone in Medina and in Mecca should give uh, bay'ah, should give the allegiance to myself, I am the Amir al-Mu'mineen. So he claimed himself as the Amir al-Mu'mineen. Now this is, a diff this is a separate subject, uh, whether what he did was right or wrong, this is not what we're going to discuss in this uh, reminder today. What we're going to discuss is the, the life of Imam Hussein. So the message was sent to Medina, to the, uh, especially to Imam Hussein, uh, Abdullah ibn <coughs> Zubayr, who both declined to give bayah and they left for Makkah al-Mukarram. This was a safe uh, passage for them. It would be, be better for them, it would be more secure for them to be in Makkah al-Mukarram. So they left with their family to Makkah al-Mukarram. They stayed there for a bit. But after that, they started receiving, uh, especially Imam uh, Hussein started receiving some letters uh, from Kufa. Now, Kufa is where uh, Ali radiallahu ta'ala, he had his, his, his basically his khalafat was, was, was established there after he left Medina. When he, left, when he leaves for uh, Mecca, he, he arrives in Mecca and it is a time of Hajj. It's the time of Hajj and people are coming from Kufa and, and bringing him letters at all oh, Imam, you know, we have these letters of bay'ah, of, 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 you know, of, of calling you to, to come to Kufa to establish a caliphate. Yeah? So he had many letters come from him. Some say it was a hundred, some say it was thousands. But that's not the main point. The main point is that he was getting the call from Al Kufa to come and establish a, a, a sort of a caliphate in Kufa. So Imam al-Hussein, he leaves for uh, Kufa after sending his, uh, his cousin, Muslim ibn Aqil, to check the situation, what is the, the ground, what is the ground like, what's the environment like, is it what the people are saying, that you know, they, they require someone to come to lead them, and if so, then send us the message back, 
in order that we can make preparation to come to Al Kufa. So Muslim Ibn Aqil, he is his cousin, his cousin goes to uh, Kufa to, to check the situation, to, you know, to, to do some investigation. And when he arrives in Al Kufa, you know, he meets the people, and you know, the, the response from the people there is that there's a new governor in, in, in town, and he is quite severe, Ibn Ziyad. So he was sent by, uh, by, the, uh, by Yazid Ibn Muawiyah to take over the affairs in Kufa because the people were rebelling against the the so-called caliph, the leader of the Muslim. So Ibn Ziyad was the uh, new appointed governor, uh, and he was told, and he was told very fiercely by uh, Yazid, that you know whatever happens, you know, we need to control the situation, and I want you to quell this uh, uprising, which was an uprising uh, by the people of Al Kufa. But then, cut the long story short, what happened to Muslim Ibn Aqil? He was killed later on by the same people he went to actually uh, investigate from, and he was killed and uh, his body uh, was actually uh, kept in the uh, Al-Kufa, so nobody found out. But when Imam al-Hussein had already left the, the plains of Mecca, and he was on his way, he was on his route out to Mecca, even before the end of Hajj. So there wasn't enough time for the messenger to reach him. But then he reached him further down the route, and he was told about the killing of his, uh, his cousin, Muslim Yaqib. Now when this news arrived, they had a consultation between, because they had the sons of Muslim Ibn Aqil present, and they were quite adamant that they would not go back until they take revenge for the death of their father. So they carried on, they, it was agreed that we will carry on towards Kufa, and don't forget with uh, Imam al Hussein was his family, his wife, his children, you know, and also the, the children of uh, Imam al Hassan, and his, his children from, from the other uh, mother as well, so there was quite a, a big uh, sort of amount, maybe some say, there was 40, some say there was 50, there's different narrations regarding the exact numbers. But before Imam al Hussein leaves for uh, Kufa, many Sahaba and Tabi'in, they advise him, you know, and um, from amongst them there were Ibn Abbas, he advises to al Hussein that, you know, don't leave al Makkah. This is a, a, a sanctity, a place of security, you are safe here. You know, you will go with your family and, you know, uh, you may not, you know, you know, protect you, but something might happen to you or your family like what happened to your father, so they remind him about what happened to his father. And what happened to his father is again a lesson for us uh, to, to, you know, to read into. So he, he took, he listened to them, Ibn Abbas, Ibn Zubayr even told him that Ibn Zubayr at that time was the, was the governor of Mecca. And you know, things were nice in Mecca, it was peaceful, there was no rebellion, there was no sort of issue, there was no fitna uh, at that time. So when he, he decides to leave with his family, they, go, they, they, they carry on uh, to the, towards uh, Al Kufa, which is, don't forget, it's in the north of, uh, of Mecca. You have to travel quite a distance. And he doesn't complete his Hajj uh, in Mecca. So the news comes to him of the killing of Muslim Ibn Yaqeel. And, but he arrives, to, uh, he arrives to, the, to the plains of Karbala before the messenger had actually got to him. But when the messenger arrived to him, they, would, they still decide that we are going to uh, carry on up to Kufa. Now this is where really uh, things sort of uh, take uh, the turn for worse. Because when they arrive to, uh, on the 60th of, after Hijri, and between the 61 after Hijri they arrive uh, to Karababala. And this hadith I mentioned to you earlier, the Prophet وسلم, was shown the dust and the, and, the, and the sand, which was going to be the place of the martyrdom of Imam al-Hussein. When they arrive to uh, Karababala, it is mentioned that the historians, they say that when the, uh, the camps, the two camps uh, met at each other, it was really the, the camp of Imam Hussein who arrived first. So they had access to the waters uh, quite freely and they would, you know, they would water the, the animals and the, the family would, would drink as well, etc. Because it is a very barren land, even up to now, I don't know, it's, it's very, very dry and there was no access to water. So they arrived, they camped. Uh, and they, they, they saw the other side approaching them. So the other side was dispatched by Ibn Ziyad to go and confront the uh, oncoming caravan from uh, Mecca and to stop them from coming to Al Kufa. Because Ibn Ziyad knew that if they entered Kufa, the two things would happen. One, there'd be a, a bloodbath, and also there'd be an uprising against him because he was quite a severe uh, governor. He was quite uh, an oppressor, as we know. And we talk about Ibn Ziyad and Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Now, what is, what is our understanding regarding these two people? And especially 
the, the killers of uh, Imam al-Husn. What do we think about them? This is something we need to uh, cover uh, before the ending of this uh, reminder as well, inshallah. So when the two, uh, uh, the two comes, I will not call them armies, because they were not armies. I mean, you cannot call a number of people who number about 40 to 50, and on the other side you have 3,000, you have 4,000, you have 5,000 well-prepared men who have come you know, to, to defend and to, to fight. So I wouldn't call them an army. They're not an army. They were not armies facing one another. There was one side you had uh, the grandson of the Prophet leaving to, you know, to enter to Al-Kufa on the request of the people of Kufa. Don't forget that. So when the issue of water arises on, on the Euphrates, uh, Imam al Hussein, uh, he was, as he was, he was a generous person, he was the grandson of the Prophet Sallallahu he allowed the other army, the other camp to feed and to take the water from the Euphrates. And this, this kept on going for a few days, for a few weeks. And it was a stalemate, they were not getting anywhere, so the Imam al Hussein, he gives them three options. To Umar ibn Sa'ad, he was a representative sent and uh, Ibn Ziyad thought that he's closer to him, so he will listen to him. So three options were given to him. Either Imam Hussein said to them, okay, let us return back to where we've come from, all our family. Let us, you know, head towards Asham to, to meet Yazid and to put our case forward to him. Or let us enter Al-Kufa. Yeah, so one of the three options. All three of them were rejected by Ibn Ziyad. And this was because he said, until and unless you give pledge it to me, we cannot talk any further. So it was really, this was the main sticking point of the whole conversation that Imam al Hussein said, no, I'm not going to bow down my head to the oppressors. I'm not going to walk away from the teachings of my grandfather, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And really, this is something which we will talk about later on, that what are the lessons for us living here, you know, as the, uh, as the inheritors uh, of this ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu what, what can we benefit and how should we react to such uh, atrocities? So all three uh, options were put forward, they were all rejected. So Ibn Ziyad, Ibn, Ibn, Ibn Ziyad sends a message to them, uh, and he sends one of his, uh, again, fearless uh, commander or general, Hur. Hur is the person who was sent uh, after uh, Umar bin Sa'ad, he felt that he was being a bit lenient with Imam al-Hussein. So he said to Umar bin Sa'ad, you come back, I will send my, you know, the, the hardcore army, hardcore general, Hur. So he comes along to, uh, to Karababala. By the way, Karababala, what he means is a place of, of trials, of temptation, of death, of destruction. Karababala, it's really a horrible name. And it is said that, you know, even when uh, anyone you know, tried to, to, to live on that area, they failed. You know, they either they had to move away or they were uh, suffocated, etc. So it was really a horrible place uh, to be in, uh, in the best of times. Never mind with your family, with, with your relations, etc. It wasn't a nice place to be. So Umar bin Sa'ad, he goes back to Al-Kufa and we have this person, Hur, who comes and he tries to negotiate and tries to, uh, you know, encourage or to, uh, you know, press Imam al-Hussein on the bay'ah, on the allegiance. He fails. He also fails and later on he said that him and his son swap sides and they join the, the ranks of Imam al-Hussein because the, Imam al-Hussein would remind them, would remind them of this share which I recited to you earlier that, you know, what would you say to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? that you have actually come out to, to, to face me, to try to kill me, to kill my family, to kill my company. What, uh, what will you ask from the Prophet How will you actually face him? So when these words were said, and there was really a, a, a big dialogue going on all the time. The two camps, they would pray, this side would pray, the other side would pray. And Imam Hussein offered to them that let's pray in Jama'ah. You know, even in such a, you know, a difficult situation, you know, one side says to the other that let's pray in Jama'ah. And it was on the Juma, which they were actually praying. Uh, separately. But Imam Hussein said to them, yeah, we are here for whatever reason we are here, but let's not, you know, divide ourselves in the, uh, in the prayer, in the salat. But on the other side, they were, they, it was rejected and they did not uh, take the offer by Imam Hussein. So this general who, who swapped sides later on, him and his son, Hur, you know, he came, he tried to come to, uh, to, to release and to, you know, put an end to the blockage. Because it was a blockage, basically they were not allowing uh, Imam Hussein to go anywhere, to either to go forward, to go back, to go sideways, they were actually stopping him at this uh, place. So this is a long narration of what happens afterwards that how the, uh, the camp of Imam Hussein was made to suffer through to, uh, due to the lack of water. Because what happened was that the, the camp of Imam Hussein was further away from the river Euphrates and the other side had total control 
of the of the waters, and they were not allowing them to drink anything, even the family, the you know the, the children, the wife, and etc. They were not allowed to have any. And it is said that they was they, they didn't have water for a few days, up to the point of the tenth of uh, Ashura, tenth of Muharram, which is the Ashura. In this uh, scene, uh, uh, Abbas is one of the cousins uh, of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He uh, went and he pledges to get some water for, uh, for one of the children who was, who was crying. And he goes out and he also, he was one of the last men who was standing uh, with Imam Hussein. He was basically his backbone. And he's also, uh, at this point, he's taken and he's killed. Uh, he's been martyred. So he comes back with, uh, the host comes back. And then this is really when uh, it dawned upon uh, Imam Hussein that really the, the time has come where, you know, it was, it was said that, you know, the dogs of this earth are going to kill you. And this is what happened. The person which I'm going to describe to you later on, who, who, uh, who struck the blow uh, to Imam Hussein, he was really uh, called the dog of, of Arabia at that time. And there's a reason why he, 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 you know, he was given this ugly task to do. You know, he was given this ugly task to do. And his name, uh, I will mention later on. So when Abbas, he, uh, he passes away, uh, he's martyred. Uh, the, uh, for a one final um, sort, of, sort of chance for peace, or for one, sort of, one final uh, attempt, Imam Hussein comes out with his, uh, with his, his son, which is about six months old, and he brings him uh, in front of the army, that he, he, he brings him up and he shows him to the other side, that, what has this son, what has this infant done to you, what has the, the women done to you, you know, what is their fault, you know, if, it, if you're after me, I'm here, but you know, at least leave them to go past and to go to either back to Mecca or to go forward to Kufa or to Sham, but no, they were not taking any of it, you know, this is how much, how much hatred, how much resilience they had, uh, in their hearts, you know, for the uh, for the other side, and this is something we got to remember that you know their 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 the eyes were, were blackened and their hearts were also blackened. Even though in the camp on the other side there were some some people who who were hesitant and who would who would who would have switched sides, but if it wasn't for the for the oppressors standing behind them or in front of them, uh, they would have switched side and they would have really resolved the issue quite quickly. This didn't happen, and it said that they had big numbers, 3,000, 4,000, and this increased uh, slowly. So, so this infant was, was shown to the other side to, you know, to, to, you know, to get some mercy, and to, you know, to show some mercy for, for the family at least. No. So this person, Qabbahullah, it is said in, in, the, in the books that, you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, blacken your face on the day of judgment. This is how the, the you know, these are, these are quite leading words. Qabbahullah wajha. This is narrating to Shimr. Shimmer is the name of this person who struck the first blow uh, against the infant, firstly, because he was crying and a lot of the people on the camp were getting emotional and they were actually going to rebel against the, the commanders at that time. So this Shimmer uh, may uh, destroy his face in the Day of Judgment. This is what we say against these sort of people. You know, we have no mercy. You know, sometimes you know, people think that you know, the Ahl Sunnah, they're a bit lenient against the killers of uh, Imam Hussein. No, we would never be lenient against them. You know? <coughs> There's something we have in us, we call ourselves Sunnis, and our, our love for the uh, Ahl al-Bayt is more than anyone else. And this is something we need to uh, reiterate at these times. You know, not, not because it is Ashura, but because it is a time when we have a lot of distortion of the creed of Ahl al-Sunnah wal-Jama'ah. So this infant was, was, was killed, was martyred, uh, and this was really the, the final uh, breaking point where Imam Hussein he returns back to his family and he says to the women and the children, even the night before, he offered them, that I advise you to leave and to leave the camps in the, you know, under the darkness of night, you know that you are safe from the... Because he knew what was coming. You know, Imam Hussain knew what was in front of him, and he knew the hadith of the Prophet <coughs> where his uh, martyrdom was uh, be told, was foretold beforehand. So he goes back to his family, and this is just finishing off the last few points. He comes back to his family, uh, his, his daughter Zainab, also he meets her, and she says to him, you know, is it true, oh father, that you know, I will be an orphan? And he says, yeah, you will be an orphan, but on the day of judgment, you'll be with your great uh, grandfather. So he says to him, he gave him the, the glad tidings. On the day of judgment, you will be the best of will be the, the best of, of people, the best of Rusul, which is your great grandfather. So she was, you know, put at ease, and she felt a bit happier. And also the family, uh, they knew what was coming, so they bid it farewell to um, Imam Al Hussein. Uh, and don't forget, he has lost his uh, his cousin. He's lost one of his other sons, and the only son that remains was was Zain Al Abidin because he was ill at that time and he was unable to fight. And he was the only remaining son from Imam al-Hussein. And he is later one that describes the events in al-Karbala. 
So he goes back to his uh, family, bids farewell to them, you know, meets all his family members. Don't forget, this time there is no many, there's no adults left in the camp. He's on his own, apart from Zayn al-Abidin. So he goes back and he comes to the, uh, the battlefield, to the uh, battle ranks. And, you know, the, the custom was that, you know, you would fight one and one. This was the custom amongst the Arabs. So they started off one and one, and they could see that Hussein was dispatch, dispatching them left, right and center. You know, the, the, the enemies, he was getting rid of them. So the, the enemy got a bit scared. So what they decided that we would all go to jump and surround uh, Imam al-Husayn. This is what they did. This was their plan. This was their wickedness. And this really shows their, their intent, what was in their heart, how much hatred they had, you know, and how much love they had for this dunya, for power. You know, and this is really something we'll describe in the end, that what was the, the, the main purpose of both sides of Imam al-Husayn, <coughs> leaving and also the side which was on the opposite. So the battle commences, and even when he is surrounded, we all know he is the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And we know that the genealogy is it's a pure genealogy, and they are, they are a family of fighters. And he fought, he fought, he, he killed so many uh, from the opposite side, but eventually, in the end, he was overcome. You know, there's only so much as a person. You have an army of two, three thousand in front of you. You, you know, there's only, only, only so much bravery you can show. But the, the bravery which he showed on that day, you will not see it any time you know, up to the day of judgment. The amount of uh, blows he took. I mean, I was reading in, in, uh, in uh, Al-Bidawan, they, they say he had about over two to three hundred uh, sort of strikes on his body and about uh, three hundred or four hundred sort, of, uh, sort of stab wounds on his body. So this is how much pain he took. We all know his horse was, uh, was taken away from him straight away. So in order to, to, you know, to, to take the advantage away from him because he was quite high up, his horse was stabbed and his horse was uh, injured. His horse was taken away from him, but he still carried on in amongst all the, the enemy combatants and he fought with them bravely. He fought them until they managed to uh, martyr him. And he was martyred and he was stuck to the ground. Uh, and we, we know that the, the, the arrow which was uh, you know, aimed towards him was again uh, thrown by this guy, uh, Shimmer bin Zil Jawthan. So he, this is his full name, Shimmer Zil bin Zil Jawthan. Uh, this is something which we say against the man of Subhana, destroy him in the hereafter. So when he, uh, he's, uh, he attains martyrdom, uh, he falls to the ground and he's constantly remembering Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even his enemies say that we haven't seen so, someone so brave in times of ease and pain uh, as we have seen Imam uh, Hussein. That you know, even when he is at the, uh, the close, the jaws of death, he's still asking Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, for steadfastness. You know, and he's still, you know, proclaiming the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with such bravery and, you know, with a full heart and desire to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. See, he falls to the ground and this is on the day of Jum'ah, the Friday prayer. Uh, and really, uh, it's the day of, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Ashura, the 10th of Ashura. Ashura was also named Ashura before this event. So some people have it in their mind that this uh, 10th of Muharram was called Ashura because of the martyrdom of Imam uh, Al-Hussain. This is not, this was called Ashura even before. <coughs> Uh, his time. Even at the time when the, the calendar was being made, they, they referred to the, uh, the Ashura as well of Muharram. So this person, Shimr, he comes up to uh, Imam al Hussein, uh, and this was an order by the leader, uh, Yazid ibn Ma'awiyah, that you know, bring me the heads of all the uh, males which you have uh, killed, all the adult males I want to see as a proof. Uh, so this really gives us an, an indication. That was Yazid, um, you know, was Yazid, you know, complacent in the killing of uh, Imam al-Husayn. This gives us an idea that maybe yes, he was. And this is something we have to be very careful because, you know, we, we say that you know we, we don't want to put a blame on anyone. But when we hear the narration that the heads were asked to be brought to uh, a sham to Damascus, and what is the reason for what was it? Literally, he wanted the heads as they were in in the state of death, or what did he mean the heads? while they were still alive. This is something which is controversial. This is something we have to be very, very careful about. And I read uh, that Ibn Kathir says that also Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, he says, uh, He says that Hussein was killed unjustly. Imam Ibn Taymiyyah says in his fatawa that Hussein was killed unjustly. And whosoever his killers were, they will not see the smell of Jannah hereafter. This is what he said. Such harsh, harsh words. And you know, we, we sometimes, you know, some people criticizing that he's been lenient, he, he wasn't being lenient, he was being, he be, he's been just with, with the just cause. So something which we should be very, very careful 
is going back to Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Was he complacent? And from, the, from what we see uh, from the narrations, uh, it looks like, and Allah knows best, that he was complacent and really uh, the, the situation uh, could have been dealt with in a better way, to say the least. <coughs> so that the heads were taken back to um, Asham and they were put on, on sticks and all the heads uh, of the adults were taken in front of the, uh, the leader. And the, the women folk, the Ahlul Bayt, uh, were given, uh, were also brought to Asham. Uh, all the uh, the wife and the, the daughters of Imam Hussein and Hassan were brought in front of um, Yazid, and the dialogue took place. You know, a lot of things were said. You know, the the, the Nisa, the women folk of the of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the companions. You know, they, they they exchanged a lot of words. But in the end, what had happened? They were given safe passage back to uh, Mecca, uh, and they went back uh, with a companion who looked after them with the officer with Zain Abidin as well at that time. And they came back to Mecca and then, uh, and they lived in Mecca until uh, the, the day which they left this world. But going back to the heads, which are very, very important, um, it's not something you know, nice to describe, but really the way uh, Yazid was poking the heads of, of, the, of the martyrs, you know, it gives you an inclination of what sort of person this was. You know, he had no remorse, you know, even though it is said that he, you know, he mentions when he sees the head of Imam Hussein that, you know, you know, how beautiful you look even now, you know. And this is something we have to take it uh, as a face, uh, face value, you know. We do not know how genuine, how much khulus is in those words, you know. Allah knows best, you know, we shouldn't uh, comment on these things. But he starts poking them, and one of the, uh, the, court, uh, the courtyard, uh, the, the one of the guards says to him, you know, if I were you, be very careful, don't poke him. And he asks why, he said, well, I've seen the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam kiss the same head which you are poking, you're making fun of, you know, at this time, what are you going to say? So this share goes back to, uh, Imam, uh, to, to uh, Yazid, and what did he say to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that what you did to his grandson on the day of judgment. And this is really a lesson for all of us, that what are we going to say on the day of judgment, that what, did, what re voice did we raise you know, to, in the face of injustice? We see injustice around us all the time, and what is our response? Did we just bow our heads and say, oh, we cannot do anything, you know, we are madhulum, you know, we are a minority, you know, we cannot do the, the least which you can do, the, the, you know, the least amount of Iman we should have is to hate it in our hearts. And we should all hate what had happened to the grandson of Rasulullah. So this is the least we should do. The second best thing is to talk and to proclaim our hatred for this event. And the third thing is to, to change it with your hands, which they did later on when the revolt happened in Medina against the, uh, the leadership of uh, Yazid ibn Muawiyah. The same thing happened to him. He, was, he died three years later. And it is narrated his death was the worst, worst of deaths in this, in, this world, in this world. And also this person, Shimon, you know, he was also killed and his head was chopped off. His head was chopped off and was put in the, the marketplace to be shown to the people. And this is what happens to a person who does such a thing against the grandson of Rasulullah So he was also, he died an awful death. And it is said that his skin started to peel off towards his end of his life. After this event of Karab Abalai, it is said that his skin would start to peel off, you know. Such was the saza, the punishment in, in this dunya. And you know, he's really someone who's described as a, as, as, as a, a really, a, I mean, a dog is, is probably a nice word for him. I'd call him more than a dog. The dog is still, you know, has some, some, is, has some respect. But really the way he's described in the books, it, it's, hor it's, it's horrific. You know, and it's said that he, he came, uh, he was actually in, in the camps of Ali radiallahu anh, at, at his time. And he was one of those who initiated the, uh, the revolt against him as well. So we, we see a, a pattern here of these people who, who like to cause trouble at all times, you know, we call them by different names, you know, we call them with, with different sort of uh, attributes. To finish off, before we go on to the uh, lessons, um, so we know that Yazid ibn Ma'ali, he stayed for three more years and he, he, he passed away, he died. And then the, the Bani Umayyah stayed in power. After the Bani Umayyah, you had the Bani Abbas, uh, and then we had, uh, so there was no other uh, Khalifa al Rashida up to the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. So he is really well, one of the descendants of Umar ibn Khattab. He was, he was known to be a just leader. He wasn't from the clan, but he was brought as a leader due to his good qualities. And he was, he was made the Khalifa, and it is known. At, at his time, there was no, so there was no need for zakat for people. People would be begging to give zakat, and nobody would accept because there was, no, uh, there was no poor people around at that time. So this is the only other example we have. Uh, from the, the time uh, of uh, the Tabi'een and Tabi'een, those that followed them. I will finish off with a few points, brothers and sisters in Islam. 
um, just to get some lessons, to, you know, to, 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 to learn some lessons from the, the life of Imam al Hussein and also his, his, his uh, children, his, his grandchildren. You know, his children become some of the great scholars of Islam. You know, Zayn al was known to be a great faqih. We have Imam Jafar, all these Jafar al-Sadiq, you know, there's so many good scholars that came uh, and actually contributed to the books of, of Sunni and also to the books of Shia as well. So we know that they are very, very knowledgeable people, people of patience. So the first lesson we must take is the, is the, is the lesson of patience. That in the face of any sort of atrocity, any zulm, that we must be patient and we mustn't cease to speak the truth. You know, it's very easy to turn around and say, that, you know, the, the oppression is too much, I can't speak anymore. The main thing is we should carry on speaking the truth. And this is one of the, the attributes, the characteristics of a Muslim, that under any circumstance, he doesn't give up speaking the truth. So lesson number one, speak the truth and be patient. Another lesson we could take is from the, from the reliance that he had on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how much bravery he shown on the battlefield. And this is something the Muslim Ummah needs at all times. And like I mentioned to you in the beginning, this shahada is something part of our religion. We cannot, you know, delete this part uh, from our religion, it's something we need to carry on. And this is something which Allah subhanahu from time to time, He will bring people out, He will show mm -hmm. this courage, and He will show real leadership in this dunya. And really, He didn't go into any extremes, you know, He didn't uh, wrong the other side. On the contrary, He, he offered them the water, He offered them, you know, the, the, uh, the option to, to, you know, to break the siege. No, but they were not taking it. So even though they were so hostile against Him, but he still carried on and he uh, continued with his struggle. So these are a few lessons which we could take. The final lesson which I would really uh, finish off with is that we should always, we shouldn't forget that our God is the hereafter. And for Imam Hussein, it wasn't about power. You know, we have this misconception that he left uh, Mecca for power. He didn't leave for power. He left because he could see that the, the way which his, his grandfather had left was being dismantled. And this is what happened. We all know after the, uh, the martyrdom of Imam al-Hassan and Imam al-Hussein, we all know what happened with the, the leadership style. It's completely changed. But again, it was something which was prophesied by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said that the Khalifa al-Khulafa al-Rashid will stay for 30 years. After that, what you will have, you will have leaders, some of them who are good, some of them who are oppressors, some of them who you... And he, at all times, what did he say? He said, listen to your leader at all times. Even if it means you have to really bite on your tongue in order to say anything. And he said that the time will come that you will, you will change your leaders, they will become better leaders. And this is something we see in history. We've had good leaders, we've had bad leaders, we've had leaders who have really made things hard for the, for the Muslim Ummah. But what we should do, we should carry on with patience. And I will finish on this point, and that this dunya for us is temporary. You know, we're not here forever. We're here for a short time and we'll be gone in a, you know, 40, 50 years. And we should do our best to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the hereafter. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to pre prepare for the hereafter. And may this life of Imam Hussein be a role model for all of us. Whichever sect we belong in, he is from, from the Ahlul Bayt, he is dear to us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us, you know, on the day of judgment, to benefit from the shifa of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and make us from amongst those who are on the right until the day of judgment. Aqulu qawli hadha, astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa nisa il muslim fa astaghfiru innahu huwa al-ghafur rahim. Shall we finish off the video? If any questions have arisen, please ask and I hope I haven't, I beg that any mistake which I have made, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive us for that. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to the straight path away from deviances, away from any sort of you know, uh, cursing any sort of tribalism, nationalism. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us away from disunity. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us united to the day of judgment. <laughs>